Oké. Okay. Welkom. I see we have um, some seven people who, uh, who are joining. And maybe we can wait for a little while. Because we have a few uh, minutes to ha have the other sessions coming to a close. Give people the chance to, uh, to come in. For those who are listening, we, are, um, we have lost one of our speakers, but uh, we know he's uh, desperately trying to get in. So uh, I hope uh, we will uh, get him back uh, on. Uh, you hear me? You hear me? Yes, Amir, we hear you. But I don't know what's happened to the system. I'm trying all the time, but let's, I will join in a second. Okay, good. What's happening? Okay. Maybe it's good if I just start because I just do the introduction and then um, by the time I'm finished, um, probably the other people have come over from the other sessions. I hope you enjoyed um, the meeting so far. Um, I've seen some interesting panels and I hope uh, this one will be an interesting uh, one too. Um, we're going to talk about disruptive technologies which change the Asian uh, markets, not only in Asia, uh, of course, all over the world, uh, but we focus on Asia uh, today. And it might be interesting if uh, we can hear from all of you, what are the typical uh, emerging technologies uh, who transform industries, companies, uh, the economy, but also the society. And It would also be very nice if you could uh, get into more detail on some of the examples in, in sectors uh, or investments to give people an idea uh, if we want to invest, uh, in what technologies we need to invest in the Asian uh, continent to get the best uh, results. I will give uh, all of you uh, some two to three minutes to, um, to make your point. And then hopefully we have some time to um, answer some questions or for you to have a dis discussion amongst each other, because that's also nice uh, if we can build uh, upon uh, our own panelists. Um, Terry, can I give you the floor, the floor as the first uh, panelist? And uh, for all the people who are listening, Terry von Bibra, as you may have seen in the program, is the director of uh, Numinos in, uh, in Germany. Terry, please go ahead. Thank you, Dennis. So, um, you know, when I was looking at the topic for our, our panel, um, technology, harnessing the potential to disrupt, um, before I go into any kind of technology, I first had to step back and think about um, why disrupt? Um, you know, disruption is um, only for disruption's sake, is frankly at best rather annoying um, and at worst um, rather wasteful of everyone's time and efforts. Um, disruption of itself is not adding value. Uh, if I look at the common themes of all the great startups um, who have gone on to become global platforms changing society and the lives of hundreds of millions or billions of consumers around the world, whether we're talking about an Alibaba, Amazon, Tencent, Google, Facebook, or any of the others, they were not focused on disruption. Um, I don't believe that was even remotely in their mind. Um, they all believed that they had recognized a way, often via new technology, but that's secondary, to do something better, often involving enabling other consumers or businesses to actively participate in order to make the world a better place. This is the common theme, not disruption, not technology. If I look at Alibaba um, as an example, the 18 founders of Alibaba, these were 18 young people, um, they saw a new technology, the internet back then, um, that would enable other young people in China to set up their own businesses and get involved in cross-border trade. Uh, that was something that until then was really you know, reserved only for state-owned companies or very large conglomerates. So for them, it wasn't about disrupting those big state-owned companies. It was about enabling other young people 
to set up businesses and participate in cross-border trade, which would make the world a better place. So if I think of our panel, um, you know, and examples of technology um, with that with that intro, with that, that caveat, you know, there's a lot of technologies going into um, one of my areas of work, uh, omni-channel, or as we would call it in Asia, uh, new retail, um, many, many different types of technology. Again, it's not about the technology. It's not about disrupting other retailers. It's about trying to find a way to make retail better, to do it better. Uh, and in fact, in Alibaba, you would say it's not about trying to increase the share of e-commerce. It's about trying to digitize retail in order to help other retailers do a better job in serving their consumers. Um, other technologies, I'm, you know, I'd be looking at obviously with AI. There's so many different things you can do with AI in terms of technology. Uh, AI for me is kind of like cloud. It's so open, it's so limitless that it's sometimes hard to, you know, talk about specific technologies because there's so many different things you can do with it. Uh, the same thing will happen with with quantum computing, with blockchain, and with many other things. But in general, just to 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 close on my my opening statement, disruption of itself is not central. Um, it's not the foundation, neither is technology. It's about founders, businesses, people obsessing and being obsessed with how to make things better, to do things in a smarter way, a more efficient way, a more effective way, using technology or disruption or flank the whatever else they can get their hands on. This is what matters to them, what they're obsessed about, but not the disruption, not the technology. I think, uh, Terry, that's a little bit disappointing for a lot of startups who are constantly thinking, um, how can I be uh, disruptive? But uh, I also hope that they got your point, that it is to make something in which you are working better than uh, than before. Um, Adam, can I give you the floor uh, next? And uh, Adam, Adam Jacobi, is the founder and chief steward of uh, MeVote in uh, Australia. Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, I, I tend to, to agree with some of what Terry said. Um, I work in a variety of different technologies at the university. So aside from, from my role in MyVote, which is an NGO, which created the first blockchain uh, voting platform in the world, um, at the university, my role inv is involved with, you know, advanced manufacturing, robotics, um, advanced materials, um, space-related sciences, AI, blockchain. And I think I agree with Terry. I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, tech is just the enabler. It, it is not going to be, you know, nobody starts a business. By, I don't think many startups um, start with the idea that the technology itself is going to disrupt entire industries to, you know disruption is like you know social media virality so people create bits of content that they hope go viral but the reality is you don't get to decide if it goes viral the market decides if it goes viral and so the same thing with disruption you, you can have a breakthrough technology um, but until the market decides that it's better than what exists today um, what you have is just a piece of technology the disruption comes from the usage and it comes from the solution um, being driven to a consumer uh, and look i think from my point of view that the big thing is that the real disruptions as i see them and the stuff that i see at the university and the partner universities that we have around the world on a daily basis is actually about the convergence of technologies and so ai on its own is powerful and blockchain on its own is powerful and advanced materials on their own are powerful but it's when you start bringing some of these technologies together that you can really have an exponential impact on what exists today um, and so even in the example that Terry used where he talked about retail, um, you can use AI in retail, you can use, um, you know, a, a whole variety of new technologies, but when you put them together, the shopping experience is changed or the um, supply chain experience is enhanced. And so it's, it's how do you understand the market well enough to know which pieces come together to create the jigsaw that will have uh, impact and ideally that impact uh, if you're doing something really right, can be disruptive. But the disruption, you hope, is is because you have a solution that otherwise hasn't been found. So short but sweet, but I think that's my answer to the first question. Now, it's interesting. Um, you, you are also you're from a university, and um, I think at universities they always say that the most interesting ideas will be born if you use different disciplines together. In, instead of one discipline uh, at a time. But you're saying to us uh, that's also valid for technology, 
if you get the right convergence, then that is uh, more interesting than just one. Yeah, and, and even if you look at the examples that Terry used in terms of Facebook and so forth, you know, Facebook as a concept wasn't disruptive uh, in terms of its technology or its, or its tech footprint. Um, there were other social media platforms that existed before. There were digital communities uh, that had been created. What they were able to do was have a, um, a CX and a, and a UX that, that was different to what came before. It was more intuitive. People liked it. It had different kind of functionality, but it wasn't out of the box tech different. It was just a, an incremental innovation on what already existed. Um, but the market decided that it liked it enough and there wasn't enough other competition around that, that it was able to spread. Okay. Um, Amir, I see you um, have come on board. Welcome. Yeah, technology Hello. needs something uh, innovation. But um, let me give the floor to uh, Girish. Um, Girish, you um, are the um, president of Asia Pacific for Tata, Tata Consulting Services in Singapore. And your full name is um, Girish Ramachandran. You are advising, I assume, many um, companies uh, in terms of uh, technology. Well, what is your take uh, on disruptive technology? <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Um, as we all, let me try to contextualize the place that we are in today. As we all know, we are in the fourth industrial revolution. And we are already seeing the, the velocity, the scale, as well as the scope of change. And if I look at fundamentally what has changed is that the large corporations or the small startups are able to compete alongside large corporations. And some fundamental changes that we observed. First of all, digital ubiquity is becoming the norm. Two, technology is already tearing down socioeconomic walls. And uh, consumers are moving away from omni-channel to omnipresence. Um, then the, the fourth one, which I find is convenience is now becoming the new currency. Um, the fifth one I find is uh, transparency, trust, loyalty, are all ex becoming extremely critical to sustain. And the final one, which I find is, um, if you go to the youngsters today, they all say that sustainability is non-negotiable. So if I put all of these things into context, and if I look at what does Industry 4.0 mean, I think it's not about business or technology, but it's all about society. And what can we do for the society at large? Okay. And like... Um, um, what uh, uh, Terry and uh, and Adam spoke about, um, you, what we have seen is technologies like AI, blockchain, data, data analytics, all are, all are enabling disruptive solutions to find the most complex societal and environmental problems. Okay? So I will give you some examples. Okay? Let's take urbanization, for example. Okay? It is one of the largest phenomena that you have seen in the world so far. Okay? Today, out of the 7 billion people, 4 billion people live in in, um, in cities. And this is likely to go up to around 5 billion by 2030. But what suddenly this pandemic has brought about is that we have found a new way of working, which is remote working. The whole world has probably um, endorsed this whole thing about remote working. And we've all figured out that we can still be as effective as what we were before by using remote technology. And that can probably help reduce pressure on urbanization. Okay. The second example I want to talk about is on food security. Okay. Today, the world produces food for 10 billion people. Okay. And we only have 7 billion people in the world. So it is not that there is not enough food that is produced today. There is enough food that is already being produced. What is What probably technology can do, like we did this for an Australian retailer, we use simple IoT sensors and we use simple technology um, using data and data analytics to find out whether a, str a freshness of a strawberry can be maintained from farm to fork. And using this, we are able to measure the, 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 the moisture content, all of that through the entire supply chain so that finally from farm to fork, the, the strawberry remained, uh, remained fresh. Okay. The same thing we have done in blockchain as well. We have done some experiments on blockchain with uh, 
prawn uh, especially when you are when you are selling prawn from india mm-hmm. to japan kirish can you um, hold that example uh, for later on no sure, i'll do that and the okay. last one i want to talk about is just one one simple one, one other one last thing which i want to just say and before i close this thing so i think you know we have a very unique opportunity on it to see whether we can bring um, sustainability and economics together with technology at the center of this when we come out of the pandemic and this is probably the single most opportunity which is there uh, in front of all of us and it is for us to see how we embrace this thank you to to take that last uh, point from you uh, girish um, i'm um, a dutch citizen uh, and we have a, a major multinational uh, company uh, dsm who is a yeah. top 50 innovative uh, company in the world and what they have done their ceo fake sibisma said to his team i want my products to be greener all of them than the competitors and bring them cheaper all of them than at the competitors and that's what they've done and it's an ideal combination of sustainability and um, and economics just to give you uh, one example uh, thank you then um i'm here um you have worked hard uh, to um get into um the system i'm glad that it um it uh, it succeeded your next up and um for our um participants amir yar is the ceo of uh, chis asia pacific uh, and uh, your life um circles around hong kong and israel if i'm not mistaken um, amir the floor is yours I tell it in short, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, a dreamer, uh, no education in my life, uh, no degree. And this is my start career in managing big companies in the world. And it's about innovation and people together. Today I have a Hong Kong company, very, very short, that deals with uh, Singapore, Bangkok, Beijing, Japan. And what we're doing, we're building partnership between uh, game-changing Israeli companies and uh, game-changing a big corporation in Asia. Um I will say just one example of what we do to understand uh, let's talk the AI as as a, as a subject. We just uh, building now a uh, AI company in Hong Kong when Mitsui invested in this and now probably CLP is going to be our first client. First time we bring connectivity between the clients and the users in, in the power grid. Uh, last week we built a AI company with Israeli SOE for water called Mekorot first time ever we putting AI in infrastructure of water and we going to this territory so my point is that technology is not just an application with clever use you can diverse it you can change it you can duplicate the models to more and more things so now i going with AI to biology AI to mental health and all these sectors so again it's, it's not about me it's about how to make the world more efficient how to reduce energy cost how to manage our resources and how to make society much stronger by using technology as something to make us stronger and, uh, and a lot, lot of csr involved that's what i do and uh, amir can you tell us um, about the ai and water infrastructure um, okay. how did it change the game I, I tell you something, and this is very, very strange because this is a real story about something we just was a dream. We were stuck in Israel. We cannot fly. So lucky me, I know the the management of the Israeli water company. They think I'm a nice person. So when I give the call to the chairman or the CEO, he asks me, Amir, what do you want? He doesn't ask, what, what do you want? How can I help you? That's my blessing. That's I met Frank about 12 years ago and other things. And I told him, look, I have a crazy company that Warren Buffett invested in her about uh, five years ago. And we're doing things in mobile, we're doing things in 5G, we're doing things in, in data centers. We start electricity and I have a crazy idea. I said, okay, I like crazy people. So we came to the meeting with the board of this SOE of water. And we said, we can save your water management by reducing the cost of energy, the pumps, the the simulation the moving water from place to place taking water to the to the mountains It says no way you cannot do it uh, and then the the labor cost the labor the engineer says no way you we put technology you would fire 20% of the labor we don't want no technology because this is government 
So we just collect data from all the center of Israel. And in six months of just putting Excel and managing the, the information, we save them 10% from the energy cost of, of the SOE for water. To give you a number, what is this 10% for the water company is 1% from the cost of energy of Israel as a country. And we aim to go to 20%. So now we're building a JV with them. They already approved the government of Israel. And uh, we're going to be a shareholder. Um, uh, we're going, they're going to invest in this company. And from here, this SOE will go to us, to every place in Asia, United Emirates, US, and they will say, we bring the know-how in water, you bring the AI, and together we change the world and making uh, more efficient in mm -hmm. water manufacturing. Now, this is a dream that came from nothing. Just people thinking and saying, hey, let's check it out. I can tell you that I'm already doing this on, on, uh, on uh, electricity. And my next hour, next crazy idea is to go to do uh, refineries. Okay, hold, and, hold your next no, 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 crazy idea. I that's my point. We, uh, we move on. Uh, yeah, 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 we have yeah, one yeah. panelist, but it's a very nice example and it gives very clearly the impact you can make uh, to your country and, and most likely to other societies uh, as well. Our last uh, panelist is uh, Naim. Uh, the floor is yours in a moment. Naim uh, Zafar is the co-founder and uh, CEO of Telesense. Um, and Naim, you're based in the US, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Yeah, I'm based in Silicon Valley, California, near San Francisco. And uh, in addition to being a serial entrepreneur, I'm also a professor at University of California, Berkeley, and at Northeastern, where I teach entrepreneurship and innovation. So I have a perspective both from academic side as well as from a being a real entrepreneur. This is my seventh company. I've done six companies before this. To me, disruption is the way of life. So I have to disagree with my some of the earlier panelists. Disruption is evolution of life. If you keep living, you die. You have to evolve. You have to disrupt things. You have to make things happen. Fortunately, the technologies are all there because there are some serious challenges which are being posed uh, uh, in worldwide, and especially in Asia. So, for example, my company, Telesense, is all about grain, agriculture. Once you harvest grain, it never improves in quality. Yet you have to make hundreds of decisions, when to sell it, when to blend it, when to fumigate it, when to preserve it, how to transport it. So we are generating data but it's using wireless sensors and with machine learning so we can give you prescriptive, actionable things, how, what action to take for your grain and eke out some extra profit for the growers, for the farmers, for the grain traders. So we are applying wireless sensing technology and artificial intelligence to specifically focus on grain and food supply. But the fact is, if you look at the next few year horizon, there are huge challenges. Let's take an example of medicine. Today, if you are in a remote village in China or some any place in the world, any third world country, for example, you're not going to get the best doctors. Best doctors may be in the metropolitan areas. And did you know, and I almost cannot believe this figure myself when I heard it, I have to double check it, how many peer reviewed medical journal articles are published every day? Answer is 20,000. Uh -huh. Who the heck is writing those? Who And who reads them? Nobody. This is where AI comes in. So now, like example of AI engines such as IBM Watson, they have read all 4 million articles and remembers them. Imagine a doctor in a remote area which is assisted by an AI engine. Looking at the symptoms, it can suggest, could we do, run that test doctor? Should, should we look at this couple of other options based on the article I read in the death journal in 2017? Doctor had no idea. So this is kind of collaborative technology plus doctor will have an impact. It will be able to provide a higher quality of medicine all over the world. Robotics is another area because of the one child policy in China and a bunch of other factors. There's an imbalance in China, especially aging population. Japan is the worst. So how will you take care of this aging population without the young blood? Robotics is going to play a huge role, exoskeletons and whatnot. Education, we all seen how we were able to shift the gears 
with online education and more to come. So there's a disruptive technologies which are being put in place. I mean, I have many other examples, but respectful of time, I'll stop here. But it, so we should, I hopefully will discuss and give you some ideas what technology tsunami is coming your way and how should you prepare yourself so you can take advantage of it and not get buried by it. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Naim. That uh, means that uh, you have all uh, made your statements. Um, and to the people who are watching um, us, um, please go ahead and ask your uh, questions uh, if you like to. Um, you have taken, I think, not um, a very different uh, view on uh, disruptive technologies, um, apart from uh, Naim, uh, who thinks it's an evolution of, uh, of life. Um, who likes to take the floor to comment maybe on something someone else has said? I, 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 would like, I would like to just address the, the last um, statement from Naim. And, and like, like Naim, I come from a, it's actually a strangely and frighteningly similar background. Um, nine companies and now at a university, so very, very similar kind of background. And like you, in innovation and entrepreneurship, that's my role at the university as well um, and have, tw you know, twice been a world's top 50 innovator. But, but I, I would say one thing that's slightly different to what Naeem was saying. And I think what we have are examples of um, disruption and we have examples of innovation. And I think innovation, to Naeem's point, is everywhere, all the time, every day, in lots of different industries and lots of different areas. And finding incremental innovations is really what business is about. It's about constantly pushing yourself to be better, to be more efficient, to find a, a better and more profitable way to go about your business. But disruption is something slightly different um, because disruption actually says that once this thing has been deployed, that what came before can no longer be. You're actually saying you're fundamentally changing the way the entire ecosystem operates by virtue of the technological intervention. And I think that that is a more rare occurrence. Um, and it really comes when, um, and only when, in my opinion, um, when there is an ecosystem approach to the design phase. So you actually have to have a strong enough understanding of all of the interrelationships that work within that ecosystem to know how pushing this particular button, using this particular technology, will start to change all of them and affect all of them. And so, for example, when we built my vote, before we ever wrote a line of code and before we ever looked at a blockchain voting solution, we spent six years understanding the ecosystem, thousands of conversations with political leaders and business leaders and community leaders and religious leaders so that we understood what democracy was meant to do. And then we understood where it was falling down and not doing it and where we could see that there were similarities in different markets and the erosion were identical. What we recognised was if you could affect the erosion points that happened in multiple markets simultaneously, then you could have a disruptive effect. But if all you're going to do is try and consolidate a change in a single market, it might be a change in that market, but it's more of an innovation than a disruption. But sometimes I, I hear companies, and I've heard it today uh, at your Eurasus meeting as well, um, my company needs to take a moonshot uh, to, to, to put a very ambitious target uh, way in the future, and we're going to use technology for that. And then I think, Terry, you mentioned uh, you shouldn't focus on the technology itself. Uh, would you think this is the wrong approach to, to think like that in a company? So if someone's aiming for a moonshot, they're aiming to do something not very disruptive. They're aiming to do something that makes a huge difference to whatever they're trying to do. Again, so disruption is secondary. They're trying to make a huge jump forward in doing something better. Um, I, I thought it was very helpful, um, Naeem's point about, about um, disruption and, and evolution. Um, so I, I, I did want to touch on that because if I think of evolution in life forms, and I'm not an expert in this, but with two university professors on the panel, I, I hope I can, I can say this, which is if I'm a life form competing with another life form, that I might use disruption if we're competing with nutrients to survive. And I would, I would posit the theory that if there were life forms with more than sufficient nutrition around them, they wouldn't bother to disrupt. They'd simply enjoy the nutrition. And companies are, are similar. Again, I don't think disruption is their goal, but if they're competing and trying to 
take the nutrition, take the market share away from another business, then they might see disruption as a tool in order to do that. But what's for me really interesting is the, the, this case that so many really powerful, very um, dynamic startups in their history, and a couple of ones that I've worked for, again, disruption wasn't the point. And I, I'd give an example with, um, with Alibaba. Um, Alibaba's working with uh, mom and pop stores in China. Um, there's over 6 million mom and pop stores that at other parts of the world actually were destroyed by e-commerce. Um, but in the case of, of China, what Alibaba is doing is using technology to enable these mom and pop stores to better survive. So instead of trying to disrupt them to say, I want to take your market share, small life form mom and pop store, I want to use my technology to help you become more successful. And again, that fits perfectly with what they're trying to do, but it goes against this idea of I have better technology, I have better access to disruption, I'm going to disrupt your business to take your market share. And they're actually doing exactly the opposite. So it's about more what, why am I using these tools as opposed to the tools are being used or the disruption happens. Of course, it happens all the time. And uh, there is, uh, there is a, there's a point I must over here. Look, guys, I'm not a professor in university, okay? But I'm managing eight, eight high tech companies, three of them on the NASDAQ. Disruptive can be, can be a threat because you have social order and everybody used to go A round, B round, C round. Big corporates, especially in Asia, is look up to bottom, not bottom to up. The world is moving the way it moves. Now, what's happening in the world? First, the technology is jumping. Secondly, the COVID-19 changed everything. So all the corporates start to think, hey guys, where do our growth come from? Where is our business modality change? Not building a plan for five years, maybe not, not for one year. Government, hey, we have challenges within the plan. What do we do with our labor? What we, how we give food to all our people? So the world is so changing, so the technology can jump over and over now. Why? Because if no technology, we cannot survive in dealing with, challenge, with those challenges. Look about me. Okay, this is my, I'm not the subject over here, but I'm an almost 50, 57 entrepreneur. I never learn economics. I never learn high tech. I never need nothing. I'm managing a cell therapy company in the NASDAQ. I'm managing a biology AI company in the NASDAQ. I'm managing a group who is doing Warren Buffett invested. And all the common ground is to educate the big corporates that leads the world and control the world or the government, especially in Asia, which is an up to bottom. If somebody knows in China what's called China Inc., but never mind here. So you have the corporates and the government, especially in Asia, leading what's going up in, in, in their territories. Mm -hmm. So you must change the mindset, mm -hmm. be open-minded to things that might be different. Mm -hmm. But then it must be working. But they start to look early and early and early stage technology and don't wait to the A, B, C, D round because they must to learn how to take risk. Because if they implement the technology in the big corporates they manage, so they do a good business, of course they like it, but they make society stronger because they lie how our technology, like you mentioned, to talk, to go to society, to use descriptions, to manage, uh, manage healthcare better, to manage biology better. So the world now is a point of changing and, and after the COVID-19, the world won't be the same. And the AI will be a very leader because AI is actually its engine that learn patterns uh, see things that human uh, human mind doesn't see. The, the another problem is how you control it and what you can do with this. But I I don't think that the world before COVID and the world after COVID, not because of the of the, of the, of the disease, will be the same. It will be much more meaningful because all the balance is changing, and we are not learning how the COVID affects us as people, is how the COVID affects us as economy, as companies, in business model, our commerce, how we connect with each other. Last sentence, I was flying to the East every month, 10 flights. Suddenly, I'm one year in Israel. Nothing happened. Yeah. I'm working with my friends with all the world, and things happening. Yes, it's, there are some challenges. But all right, let's, let's bring it back to our main topic, guys. We are off topic. Yeah, Naim, before I give you the floor back, um, I'm very conscious that I interrupted Girish um, when you, I said, hold your example. Maybe you can uh, post your example into the discussion we had around uh, Naeem's uh, challenge. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anna. No, I, um, I certainly believe that um, 
we are bringing all of this because we finally see that there is a set of people ready to buy our products or services <laughs> and we should look at what has changed from a consumer perspective from a consumer perspective there are three four things which has changed first and foremost thing all of us today expect that we are treated by a business by any 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 business as if we are their only customer so which is which is very important okay the second most important thing we see is that all of us are looking for a price point of a product or service to be provided at a price which is much lower than what we paid the particular product for the third thing which we talked about is whole thing about ecosystem we are we were always looking for what is what are people looking at right uh, when i am traveling i am not looking at only a travel destination a to b i am looking at the whole experience so if i look at all of these things together and it what has probably changed in technology is that there are three or four technologies which has come together which is ai data analytics blockchain a uh, whole of that and data has become very very critical what all, and and the cloud enabling all of this what we have been able to do is all of these three or four technologies have been able to work together to help solve a consumer's problem i think at the end of it we all should know that we are all consumers and the reason why companies or business exist is because there is somebody to buy our product or service and that is the single most thing which i wanted to uh, say i can give a whole lot of examples of what we see in this but i just wanted to uh, contextualize and say that we should not forget that there is a consumer at, at the end of it whose expectations have changed Okay. In the meantime, um, we received uh, a question from uh, Gregory uh, Millen, and he asks your thoughts on the energy investment required for energy return equation to design, build the new tech renewables to transition. I think he wants to hear something about new energy uh, transformations. Any one of you uh, can say something about that? Yeah, I can say a few things. Okay, so, name. New energy is going to. I'm going to give you two examples. So one thing is we have been relying on the power plants in every country. The trend right now is a virtual power plant. So think about this. Instead of having a big grid just supplying the whole city, when you have to plan for when the peak need would be, we're going to go down to something called the nano grid. nano grid be as simple as managing a, some a single home or a cluster of small 5 to 10 homes the cloud will provide the anticipated energy need and allocation whether it's coming from solar or other places so this trend of virtual power plant is extremely powerful and will solve many problem with energy distribution but let me give you a second example to see the need for energy will change because i think the people hopefully are joining this session they also want to get a perspective of what does it mean to them down the road where should they invest where should they start a company today a huge amount of people are employed in logistics making material in china or asia and shipping to europe and america shipping industry logistics <coughs> excuse me what going to happen in the next few years there will be nothing shipped ooh <laughs> Except an electronic file, so you will be 3D printing the whatever you need, very very you need it. So what will be shipped will be a 3D printable file. My local mall, which will be mostly empty soon, they will be the three. Well, I'll go there and pick up that toaster or whatever the machinery I need. Today this is being done for books. When you print a million books, you're not physically shipping million books. They are 3D printed on demand at the location, eliminating the whole logistics supply chain, FedEx, large shipping. Imagine that happening to other complex machinery. All the pieces are coming together. We are almost there. We can see it is happening in some places. This will disrupt employment. This will disrupt energy need. This will disrupt environment. This is huge. and um gregory is not uh, easily satisfied so he uh, asks um, uh, more clarification he says it's about the cost on the national resources which are rapidly depleting to build this new tech this requires huge energy investment to get the return of the energy that can be outputted but um let's leave it um, at here huh? the, he's talking about the life cycle uh, cost 
let's go back to the question of this uh, evolution of life, uh, Naim, which you uh, put on the table. Anyone, another remark on that? Or maybe something else you want to share? Yeah, the only thing I would say about the evolution of, of life conversation is that, you know, evolution and disruption are not necessarily the same thing um, and that evolution suggests that there is a slow and steady change. It's an incremental movement. Um, it's a never-ending movement. Disruption is about something that's a little bit a little bit more harsh um, in the change and, and it's coming because something else doesn't work um, or it stopped working or, it, or there's a gap. Um, and, and I think that technology that is, I think technology has the opportunity to be both and it, and it is both all the time, um, but I think it depends on what the design is. And so for somebody like Naeem and I who come out of the university environment, um, I, I, you know, and I'm involved in the research side of technology as opposed to being a professor who teaches, um, the reality is that I, I think a lot of the tech that happens is slow because a lot of it is theoretical and it's research for the sake of research and we're working on new technologies but you don't really know what they're going to be and what they can do and the impact that they can have where you're building technology when i put the entrepreneur's hat on and you say there is a market need and therefore we will build that's a very different kind of environment because you're actually building to satisfy a change because you've recognized there's a gap rather than building a technology that might have a gestation period of 20 or 30 years before you understand what the market implications are. And so they're, very, they're different sides of the same coin, but what they talk about is the velocity of change that will be driven. Okay. Disruption. Disruption. Sorry. Disruption. No. What happened to all the travel agents? What, where did they go? That was disrupted. What Uber is doing to its taxi industry, that's disruption. What Airbnb is doing to the hotel industry is disruption. I totally agree. Negative. Totally agree. But, but you're doing, this is the thing in the tech conversation. They're very small examples of seas of thousands and thousands of tech companies, but we can only ever point to five, six, seven, eight, nine of them. And that's the point. The disruption is rare. Okay. I'm a chair of a business school, and I know put two professors in a room, and they can argue about a lot of things, many, many uh, even details. We have three minutes left. So I like to uh, give... Um, Maybe Amir or Terry or Grish the chance to say a few words of interest, interesting examples, maybe for our participants. Uh, look, I, I want to share something about technologies, and and one of them is is be open minded. Because I, I give you in, one minute, Amir, because we have two minutes left. Go ahead. No, I do it very, very short. I just give you just example. Good. Imagine that you you know a company called Mitech that that actually in Israel they're printing uh, meat without animals. Imagine that I heard about something that uh, going to grow cannabis without using plants, without growing on land. By the way, <laughs> it's not illusion. I am talking about things that might be happened. I, I see. I see. We should get ready as as people, as a society, as a government that what we know today won't be exist in ten years. I think our kids are more, more flexible minded that we are the father, the grandfathers and the plants and we are be open minded. And the question if we will see all this as a threat or as an opportunity. And this is a, a big challenge for society to want to take it. And the COVID-19 was again an example how we can use the COVID-19 as something to control people or they let things go. So the philosophical question are here are amazing. That's my point. Thanks. And then 30 seconds for Terry to close. Yeah. So I, I, I want to give two examples. I mean, for example, anything, any any prawn or anything that we, we export from India to European Union or Japan has to have um, end-to-end -end visibility. Okay. So we built a very simple blockchain-based solution by which anybody can just go and pick up a, if you're, you're buying a prawn from 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 Japan, you just need to uh, scan it and then automatically the, the track and trace works all the way up to which farm it came from. Okay. Similarly, the second important thing that we see in, in Singapore, we run this pretty, very interesting program with Singapore Management University, where we believe that today we have almost a billion people who are over 60 years of age that will become almost 2 billion people in the next 10 years. Okay. And what we need is we are going to have so many elders who are going to sit at home and idle. Okay. And we build a technology-based solution on how to make their silver age more, more, more useful. 
So I think technology is there to solve a lot of these issues. Thanks, uh, Girish. Terry, the last uh, 30 seconds are for you. I'm going to try to say this in 30 seconds. So sticking to our themes of technology and disruption, I have to go back to Jack Ma. Jack Ma was as once asked, you're an internet company, use internet technology. Why are you doing all these different things? His answer was, the internet is like electricity. No one says to people, you're an electrical company, so you could only do this one thing. With electricity, I can do anything. Yes. With the internet or digital technologies, I can do anything. So there is no limit. So don't worry about the limits. Don't worry about the technology. Figure out what you want to do and be obsessed about doing that better. Thanks a lot, um, Terry, Adam, Yurish, Amir, Naeem. Thanks very much. I thought it was very interesting. And we go to a new session. Bye-bye. Thank you, Annette. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Thanks, everyone.